um, I want to make sure that we give and bestow the honor onto Dr. Jacobs. So Dr. Jacobs, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Shinjini. I'm delighted to be here. And um, I also noted the um, flotilla filling the chat. I see people in, from Mississippi and the Philippines. And what I would just say is this really is a global enterprise. And that everyone who works in schools knows that the design of curriculum is setting up a pathway that matters, that breathes, as you were saying in your lovely introduction. So we're looking at this essential question, and this will govern everything we do through the three webinars. Our purpose is to design curriculum, to design learning experiences to prepare your kids, whatever age, wherever they're located for the future. And frankly, right now, with all we're dealing with in this world, I can't think of anything more timely for you to wrestle with. I also want to simply say, you're going to be making decisions in the short term. You, you, some of you are working online all the time right now. Some are in hybrids, which are very hard to juggle. And some of you are on site and still having the challenge, of course, of how to deal with this pandemic and moving forward. So we're going to need to ask questions in the short term. But I think a big part of the promise of our three webinars is the long game. How can we begin to plan, it, plan for the future of our kids? Now, anybody who's ever worked with me knows I only have one rule of engagement. I do not expect you to agree with me on everything. You're adults, you're professionals, you will have your point of view. The only thing I ask is when you make decisions moving forward, whether it's curriculum, instruction, assessment, or even how you set up the schedule of your day, it should always be in your student's best interest. That's it. It should not be based on habit, what we're used to doing. It should be on their best interest. And by the way, I believe the medical profession adheres to that. They, I believe they say, I shall do no harm. It shall always be in the patient's best interest. So we don't have to agree on everything, but we do have to agree that our decisions will be based on their best interest. Um, should, I am not able to move forward with the tool here. So um, I'm going to need, um, is it over here? Uh, Keenan? Yeah. Yeah. There. Okay. okay. Great. Excuse me for that. Very exciting moment. All right. In Latin, curriculum means a path to run in small steps, a course to run. I love that meaning. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're making choices about the pathway for your learners. What is curriculum mapping? All right, so I like to think of, of mapping. It's a step-by-step -step approach, um, but I like to think of it as a coin with two sides. One side of the coin are the maps themselves, and we will talk about different degrees of detail on those maps, the documentation. But it's the other side of the coin that matters. It's the review process. In other words, mapping is a verb. It's a strategic design and review process. I can put it even more directly. Having maps won't help your learners. Using them will. So with that in mind, okay, you know, there, let's go back. I need a little assistance here because the little symbol system is so dark on this slide. Uh, Keenan, can you step in please and help me go back here? Great, thank you. I think the problem, just for the record, is it's so dark on the page that the little uh, arrows don't show up. So I think I'm going to need to work with you, Keenan, on that. Are we good? OK. Um, there, I believe also one of the approaches to mapping is that it's a solution to address problems. So if you don't know why you're mapping, you're not going to need, you're not going to want to do it. But to me, it's the platform and the place where you can deal with a series of um, solutions to specific problems. We're going to go through these. Gaining information, avoiding repetitions, identifying gaps, locating potential areas for integration, aligning and matching with learner standards, examining for timeliness and coherence. I'm going to go back into these in a little more detail, and I'm going to work with Keenan 
who's going to show you some examples from Chalk in, in the way this platform works. And for the record, uh, you know, I am delighted to be working with Chalk, but I work with all kinds of mapping software platforms. For me, what I think is exciting, however, is in this instance, they're going out to try to help you as Chalk users or mappers in, in dealing with these poten potential problems and, and the solutions that follow. So let's go to the first one. Let's look at gaining information. Here's one of the things that I have often said is as a teacher, I'm as good as what I know. So if I'm not even clear, really clear about what's happened the year before in a class, say I'm a third grade teacher, how can I build on it? If I'm not sure what's going on down the hall in another subject, let's say I'm a seventh grade science teacher, I'd like to know what they're doing in math. Potentially I'm working on a physics problem and we could bring in the math. Or I'm a high school teacher and I teach seniors in my social studies class, but I want to go back over and look at what preceded in the previous years. The point here is I want to gain information. And let's be clear, standards don't tell you that. Curriculum guides don't tell you that. Those are projected possibilities. What tells you that is for teachers to put in what they're really working on authentically. Keenan, you wanted to show an example here. Sorry about that, just quick click. Um, so uh, going into the examples here for gain information, um, as Heidi mentioned, I just wanted to quickly show it in the app here just to give you an idea of what would be possible with the map setup in Chalk um, and really any kind of mapping is here we can just see as an example of various maps that would be established within your institution. Uh, you would have the option to select a map from the list here and just see a quick high level overview of some of the information. And because this is set up at your institution, you'd be able to see all the different grade levels and subject areas that are available. And then click view here to be able to jump in and at a glance see just an overview of the information in there and then further dive into these different components from here. So that's just one way you'd be able to gain information. And um, I'll toggle back here and just Heidi, if, if it helps at all, the arrows on your keyboard will work as well to navigate through the slides, if that's of any no, benefit. We didn't before, but this, this is to be investigated. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Everybody understands who's watching. That's no problem. Let me yeah. try. That's how you know it's really live. <laughs> if I got to tell you something, I'm using it now and it's not working. Okay. All right. Here, so I'll, I got you. Yeah, there we go. Um, as you can tell, these are really nice people to work with. <laughs> okay. Now, this is a big one. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems that you might think about, like in looking at a problem you might want to investigate and a reason to map with your school is repetition. And I want to clarify something. Um, I think that the um, uh, issue of repetition occurs because there's confusion between repetition and redundancy. And there's a difference between redund redundancy and spiraling. So for example, there's a very well-known book by Lois Lowry called The Giver. I bet you a lot of you know that book. But I have been in schools where the giver is taught repeatedly. It's, an, it's about an 11-year-old turning 12 in the, in the future. And it's a, a, it's a brilliantly conceived story and very respectful of, of, of readers at that age. And, and, and that's one of the reasons they like it. But when you're 11 turning 12, that makes you around, let's say, around fifth or sixth grade. So many teachers choose to use it. But I have definitely seen students go two years later and they're in an eighth grade class. And the teachers as we're doing the giver and the kids say, well, but we did it before. And you know, what's the teacher gonna say? Yeah, but not with me, you know, it's a new experience. I don't think that's useful. The other type of repetition that's problematic is if we keep saying, say for example, some foundational skill work in mathematics, let's say it has to do uh, with decimal place and place value. And we see it done again and again and again and again and again on the same level year after year, it tells you that we've got a problem. So one thing that mapping does, it, it allows you to dive in and, and find out why do we keep repeating things? And by the way, sometimes let's be honest, teachers change grade levels and take their units with them. So we see them again. The idea is to look vertically in particular, a vertical view 
of where repetitions might actually be inhibiting our learners. Uh, Keenan? Yeah, all right. So um, switching back over here, uh, again, quickly just wanted to show you some of the different ways that you'd be able to find um, where there are areas where there might be repetition. So this is just a very quick example, um, probably not as in-depth <laughs> as uh, what was just walking through there, but I just wanted to quickly show you um, the option as you're kind of creating your content, you can very quickly and easily search maybe key um, focus areas or uh, just themes that you might want to learn a little bit more about. So in this case, we're looking at our pre-AP world history, and we're trying to see where within this are we talking about trade, um, just to see where that might be covered. And then you can quickly jump in and see where that keyword has shown up. Um, we're looking at one map right now. We'll show you shortly here as well. There are different ways you can look across more than one map to find this type of information. Yeah, I think that to that point, um... And I'm, I'm kind of glad you showed that example because it would certainly be a good thing for me as a teacher to look at that within my own framework. But I think the, the, the big value for a system is, is for you to be able to see what's preceded. It's also a way to gain information, but repeated repetitions are a sign that something's not quite right. It's different than a spiral. Things can spiral and get more sophisticated. Let's go to the next slide. So I would say this is probably the number one reason when I've worked over the years and I developed this mapping model. My first book on mapping was in 1997 and I've continued to work on this through my career. Right now, most of my work is on the modernization of curriculum. Some of you know that in learning environments. So it's been fascinating to watch this work grow and develop. But I will tell you straight out, really, in my career, this is the number one driver. This is the reason people start mapping is to do gap analysis we have some gaps, we have some skill gaps, we're seeing it in our learners. And because everybody's got their year and they're really doing their best to get through it, we don't always have the ability to look at maybe that this was a cumulative gap. Maybe I made an assumption as a ninth grade teacher about some of the skills they received in eight, seven, six or something like that and they're not there. It may be that students just don't get it. Maybe we didn't spend enough time, but gap analysis, you cannot lose. It gives you the opportunity to find holes in your curriculum so that you not only can patch them, but you may even go, we need to do more of an overhaul, as well as maybe something more invasive to help specific learners. Keenan? Thank you. So uh, kind of going back to that example you talked a little bit about there of kind of understanding what have my learners really been prepared for leading up to this. Um, I'm going to switch over here to our map comparison. So this is where you could potentially do some gap analysis. So in this case, we're looking at uh, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. So really that vertical of math and how we're going to be going through those concepts with students. And if I'm looking to better understand maybe a focus area such as fractions, what I can do is using the search up here, search for that keyword fractions, hit enter. And then based on that, it will highlight for me where within these curriculum maps am I focusing on that particular concept? So you can better understand what and how are they learning it in grade two, that's preparing them for third grade, that's preparing them fourth grade. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways you could take advantage of this once you have your, your content built out here. Let me add something to this because here's something, we'll get a little more into this in the second webinar um, and especially the third one where I'm gonna look at um, uh, this uh, idea of uh, informing your maps with assessment data is it may be that you've been teaching about fractions, but the gap might be you don't have the right assessment tool, or it may not be, it may be we're going after the wrong skill set related to fractions, and we need to look more thoughtfully at what it is we need our kids to demonstrate. But this is one that is particularly potent and, and very valuable. Next slide, please. I think um, aligning with standards is, um, is really a particular challenge. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit further on in the webinar today. But um, the one thing I would be careful about here is that uh, standards aren't a checklist. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. And standards aren't curriculum. They're kind of a spine of proficiency targets looking for a place to live in the school year. So as I lay out my horizontal view of the year, and I'm looking at the place where I can bundle standards and embed them in the curriculum. You can look at natural places for that that will be aligned to your assessment. And 
Again, I'll go through that more in a moment, but I, I just want to point out, we don't really teach standards, students demonstrate them. So what we're looking at is teaching students how to show more mastery and where can we populate that. The other thing about alignment is standards, as you all know, are vertically articulated, they're scaffolded. So uh, they're K-12 propositions. So if I were looking at um, a, an area, let's say I was looking in the States, we use um, uh, next-gen science standards in many, in many of our states and districts and private schools as well. If, if I'm looking at next-generation science standards, they're developed K through 12. I wanna look at how we can ensure that the layout of those, it works naturally where they're going to be assessed and also where I can set priorities. You can't do every standard. Can I just say that publicly? This is being recorded, so I'm on record. You just can't. So the idea is how does it make sense for, remember, the best interests of our kids. Keenan? Yeah, so, and, and I'm glad you, we had a pretty great conversation about this actually when we were prepping for this uh, and different ways that you can align standards using the software. So I, I just wanted to highlight, um, and this is actually content, uh, Heidi, that you uh, put together. And I, I did play around with it a little bit just to show you how with some of the resources that we have in chalk, it's a, you're able to draw on. So the standards are already existing in the system and it, that enables you to do is really track them. You're not typing them in, you're just pulling them in and associating them. And that enables you to do things like gap analysis on the standards and uh, different types of reports. Um, kind of speaking a bit to what you're talking about, about lining is within it, you can also align the standards directly to not only resources, which I know I, I, I want to talk a little bit about there, the difference between you can associate it directly to resources that might be helping with teaching these types of things, but also directly to um, assessments or any other types of uh, activities that are checking for understanding so that you can better understand what types of things are we doing to really know if the students are, are developing an understanding of these different concepts. We're good. You were you you did a good job. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. All right. So we look at uh, uh, alignment, and now let's let's go to our next slide. So one of uh, my very favorite areas uh, to think about is curriculum integration, as opposed to curriculum dis disintegration. And um, what we look at when we think of integration, um, I think, um, and we'll spend more time on this in subsequent sessions, but you know, um, it is absolutely um, very rich and meaningful to create interdisciplinary connections, but interdisciplinary has to be natural. You know, a forced connection is a contradiction in terms, right? So it's not like everything uh, connects. It just doesn't work that way. It's that when you lay out your year and you're also working, say, with colleagues, let's say the three of us, the panelists, were all teachers in a middle school. And let's say, uh, Keenan, you're science. Um, I'm working in humanities. Let's say you're working in math, uh, uh, Ginny, and, and and the three of us are looking across the year and we're looking for a places where we could do some really nice collaboration. That's great. And we can find them if they're natural, we can't force them, but we can see some possibilities. So let's say we're looking at issues regarding climate change. And I want my students in humanities to take a stand on an issue, create a persuasive documentary. You're teaching it in environmental science. You wanna have them have a chance to do applied statistics and, and prediction. And this is, a, this is a good one. That's great. And what's really cool is when you've got a platform, remember how we can gain information? You can be very deliberate about that. But it's also integrating even within fields as well. So within a science department, you can look at those possibilities. Elementary teachers teach this way a lot. So the possibilities for integration, I think are, are tremendous here too. Keenan? Yeah, so um, I, I'll admit I like your example a little bit more than mine, but we're going to show mine anyway because it's right here. Uh, <laughs> um, so one of the examples when we're talking about kind of um, integrating across and, and one of the examples I brought up here was between, let's say, social studies and, and language arts. Uh, and in this case, uh, one of the terms that I know uh, the way that we set it up here is if you're looking for maybe debate. Um, so in our ELA class, we can see 
when they're either looking at kind of formulating arguments, but we can also kind of see the practical application of that in different eras and really kind of tie those different concepts together across those. So that's just an example of how, again, once you have your content established, there's a lot of different ways. So if it's facilitating between that language arts teacher and the social studies teacher, this would be an area where they could come. Maybe if the science teacher drops in, they can quickly come over here and add the science map and then kind of continue that conversation to understand where those opportunities might lie. Can I also make a quick observation here? Because I think it gets lost sometimes. This idea of integration is not new. You know, I, I actually wrote a book about interdisciplinary years ago, and I'm still fascinated by it. I think there's other options too out there for designing curriculum, but, but here's one of the interesting things. Um, it's not new, but it used to be people would go into a faculty room and put a big piece of butcher paper up and do it on walls with markers and lay it out or there used to be a time where we had binders. Some of the people who are listening will know what I'm talking about. And it was just terrible. If you left your binder on the bus, there went the fourth grade curriculum. I mean, the point was, it was unwieldy. Now look what we can do. I, I can do this virtually. I can meet with you and plan it in a way that's so much easier um, to have happen. I'm already seeing chats come up going, OMG, I remember all of those. That's exactly right. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, to create emotional disturbance by bringing this up. <laughs> those were pretty wacky walls. All right, let's keep going. This is one that is probably most current for me. Um, I, I've written a couple books recently. Uh, actually, I started, I think it was uh, in 2010 when I wrote Curriculum 21 about um, educating for a modern world. Then I did a series of books on the new literacies. Um, and the book I did with um, um, Marie Alcock on Bold Moves for Schools is all about the modernization of school environments and curriculum and hitting the refresh button. Uh, this to me is one of the top points and we'll spend quite a bit of time on this later. But the idea is to be very deliberate about cutting out that which is dated and making sure what we deal with is relevant, that we're using new tools and literacies, and that we're able to um, engage our students also in timely content too. So this gives you a kind of editorial process to, to make that happen. Next slide. So one other important piece is, um, is coherence. Um, often you'll hear me reference architects. Um, for a period of time um, in, in, uh, in, in the past, I worked for over a decade at Columbia University in New York at the Graduate School of Education there, Teachers College. That's where I got my doctorate and was um, adjunct professor there and in my curriculum design courses, I would frequently co-teach with an architect. And the analogies to architecture are just stupendous here. And one of the things architects do is they ask, who is the building for? I want you to think about that. What, what should go into its foundation? What style makes sense? What materials? Listen to this. What are the local zoning laws? But one of the things they do is they begin sketching. They start with sketching and then they pull it together. They need to know the building stands, that it's coherent, that the pieces work together. To me, the biggest problem with mapping straight out is it, when it becomes cut and paste, then there's no building there. It will not hold up. This is, can't be static. It has to be absolutely viable that we're making those decisions, and more importantly, that the elements work together. When we get to next week's sessions and we look at the element of um, essential questions or your choices on content and skills and very important, your assessments aligned to standards, we wanna make sure these work together. It's not just putting something in a box. Your building will fall. Keenan? So we have a poll. What problems do you hope to address in your mapping initiative? And you've seen them listed. You saw them from the beginning, gaining information, repetitions, gaps, um, aligning to standard, standards, integration. Uh, let's see what you have, what you wanna say here. Should we take just a moment and is the poll out there?
people are putting it in the chat right now. Tina, do you need support on this? I believe the poll should have popped up onto your Zoom screen. Hopefully everyone's able That's to see it. Now. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's there now, sorry about that. Thank you guys. <laughs> if you can fill this in, let's see if we start to see a response. I can't see the response here. This is just the form, correct? Yes, I do. Uh, we'll just wait until after everyone's kind of done the poll. Good, and then, yeah. I'm my iced tea, it's all good. Yeah. We're at uh, about half the folks have answered. If you haven't had a chance to answer, go ahead and fill in that poll. We'll leave it up for another uh, about, let's say, 20 seconds here or so. Yeah. Would be a good time to cue some elevator music, I think. We'll set it <laughs> I up for next session. Yeah, I don't have any <laughs> waiting. Like they don't see the poll. Um, poll just popped up. There you go. All okay. Right. Maybe we'll, we'll give it another 30 seconds because I think maybe it's just taking a while for a couple people. Yeah. 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 We got a lot of people who've responded here. Awesome. Uh, while we are waiting, if everyone can sign, put in their questions in the Q and A uh, instead of the chat, it's a lot easier for us to keep a track of it and not have those questions get lost uh, near the end of the session. Thanks, everyone. All right. So I think we've we've stabled out here. So I'll go ahead and end the poll, and then we can show the results. Um, can you see that? Okay, Heidi. I can also. I'll just click share results here. Uh, everyone can, can see, see that. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Interesting. By far and away, 62% identify gaps. It, it's not, it really is. It, can I also say it is very, a very, um, it's very uh, common for this to come up first, not common in a bad way, but in a good way. I'm just going to coach you this way because some of you, I believe, are here because you're trying to figure out how to get your staff um, involved this is usually a winner that everybody knows there's gaps. And if you think about that idea of the pathway, there's no path if there's holes in the path. And, and so one of the things that, that you can do is even combine some of these. So if I were thinking about this, I might say like there were a lot of people looking at internal coherence, that's a good one, is let's double check to ensure that the assessments we have really align not only to the standards, but that our units are really strong and focused so that the essential questions really get to our kids. Or you might say, we, we really need to work on standards. I think that standards and gaps together work quite nicely, but um, you, um, you're going to figure that out yourselves. And I think that um, uh, actually doing what we just did with you is something good to do with the faculty. Now, in other words, when somebody says, Heidi, we are, they're just not sure why we're mapping. I go, well, we need to go explain what you can do. I mean, people are pretty busy. They're, they've got their hands full, and especially this year. But if you stop and go, listen, we're looking at moving into a mapping initiative. What are some of the problems we want to face? And here's my other side. This is a good one. <laughs> how else are you going to deal with them? How, how, how can you deal with, with gap analysis if you're not sure what's going on? How can you align to standards if we're not really sure how they're laid out? So, so the point here is it's kind of just good sense. And we, we, can, we can work from it from there. Uh, let's continue with the slides. I think we're on a pretty good trajectory on our pace right now. Okay. So um, I've written a, a number of books uh, on curriculum mapping. And uh, one of the books I did with uh, Dr. Ann Johnson who is uh, the chief academic officer in Umbel ISD. That's H-U-M-B-L-E in um, outside of Houston. It's a big suburban district there. But I've known Anne for years. I met her in Iowa. I worked with her in a whole array of different school settings. Um, we did some professional work together, uh, but she is truly uh, one of the best administrators I know. I really mean that she's incredible. And, we collaborated on a book um, on curriculum mapping tools and templates with ASCD. 
And we had kind of refined and got to four phases for rolling out mapping. And these have stood up very, very well. And I've continued to use these in my work and continue to do it now in terms of the modernization of, of the map. So what we're going to look at in our three webinars is really zooming in on the focus areas. And the first one is laying a foundation with a driving mission. But laying a foundation is also establishing the purpose, which is what we've just been doing is to sort of open the, the portal there for people to think about, why should we do this work? The second, which we'll spend more time on in our next session, is launching a quality mapping process. And I want to put a big circle around that word quality. What does quality curriculum look like when it's well-designed and responsive to those kids? Remember that first rule? We got to do everything in, in your kid's best interest. The third is informing maps with assessment findings through vertical and horizontal reviews. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's the review process. That's where we begin to search maps to find out about those gaps, or even where things are really working to take it further. And the fourth is probably my favorite, and that's a, a constant pattern of renewal, of making sure what we're doing is timely and responsive. So that if we say started a personalized learning program, we've got to go take a look at our curriculum to see how we're preparing kids to make have more voice and choice in what they're doing, as much as are we current in the latest work in science. So those are the four um, uh, fundamental phases. Today's the first, next time's the second, and we're going to put the third and fourth together in our third webinar to kind of give you a little bit of structure there. Okay, let's keep rolling. So laying a foundation, I think basically what we're saying is we're unpacking the precise needs of every student in your care. I want you to notice we started with your, your clients, your students. You know, I've mapped in so many different schools in so many different situations. It's been my good fortune, fortune to work around the world in a lot of different settings. No two schools are identical. I'm just stating what's obvious, but it's really true. In fact, I can be in a community and 10 miles away is another elementary school that is 180 degrees different. You have different students, you have different communities. If you're in a school near a university, there's more transiency, there's more turnover. Some kids are in rural areas and go from rural areas to a regional high school. Some students are in international schools where there can be changes or shifts in the national policies that affect that particular school. Some places are urban centers where you have the richness of an urban environment, but also the challenges of multiple languages. And so the list goes on. So the point here is you got a map for your group, not, not, not a school down the, not the other side of town. We want to establish our purposes. That's how we started. And we elected to start that way because I'm also modeling something I think is important. I start with what mapping can do. And out of that, it allows us to get to the foundation much faster. I think having a mission that matters is more important than you realize. I want to get into that in a moment. It really makes a difference. Not a drive-by mission, but a real one that galvanizes faculty. We want to select our priority standards or the proficiency targets that are guiding our work. Again, I repeat, standards aren't a checklist. We'll touch on that too. We have to recognize the non-negotiables and there very well may be a lot of them. You may have mandates, you may have requirements. Your students maybe have to take a test. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday um, with a gentleman in a state in the Midwest where every student, no matter who they are, has to take an SAT for graduation. And what he was saying is a portion of his students have, they don't want to go to college. They want to go straight to the workforce. They're not doing any preparation on the SAT. But he says, I still have to have them take it. The, the point here is there are some things that are non-negotiable. There may be non-negotiables that deal with perhaps some of your student population that has high risk or needs. You may be a school that is required to have a facility or work with students with special needs and you wanna do a good job of integrating that. My point here is we gotta be real. And what we really wanna do is clarify outcomes for our learners and those may be diversified as well. Next slide, please. 
So when you have determined your key reasons for mapping, you can begin with more confidence. Now, here's a really important coaching point. And I wrote about this in another book I did uh, for ASCD um, on, on getting results with curriculum mapping. But the key finding we found when we worked with uh, leadership teams and did a lot of interviews in our research about what constituted something that lasted where mapping has traction. That's a good word. It has traction. In, in your institution, it was that the group started not by hierarchical top down, like I'm the superintendent or I'm the headmaster or principal, you will map because I say so, but rather there is a task force. Now, why do I say that? Because task forces disband once they start. True that instead of a set group, like you might have a curriculum council, they may do a great job, but they always are there. In fact, maybe, maybe the problem with committees and councils is they're kind of a definition of infinity. They never end, as opposed to something that's lean and mean and focused. And so a task force group really dives in and begins to draft a plan to um, bring in uh, faculty and to implement the work. You can add to the committees, you can add to the councils. Their role is critical, but you've got to add some teacher leaders in there too. And even in the smallest of schools, I've made this, I've, I've made the de determination this happens. I've been in schools that are one room schoolhouses. I really have, and they have a wide student population. So there's three teachers. Well, they are the task force, but they're involved. And maybe we invite some parents or other people to contribute as well. Next slide, please. So the other is to really go through with your task force who your learners are, their demographics, their aspirations. And that's huge these days. Oh my gosh, that's big. I, I, I hear too often these days from teachers, especially high school teachers. We have too many students that are just feeling like they've thrown in the towel. They're saying something like, Listen, I don't want to be creative. Uh, leave me alone. I've got enough on my plate. I just want to survive school. That's hard. There's other places that are highly motivated and aspirations matter because you can design experiences to lift up and motivate. We look at our community values, the special needs of our students, teacher perceptions and learner perceptions of the students. People act on their perceptions. If, if my kids in my school believe they can do well, and I can think of quite a number of schools that that's been the mantra, it starts to show we act differently that way. This is who you're mapping for. So you can see to start, I really am worried about a school that says, oh, we're just gonna start mapping and put stuff in the maps. I'm going, you gotta think about who this is for, or otherwise you're gonna hit the wall. Next slide, please. Two practical drivers to a successful mapping effort. Have a clear reason that is embraced by your school community and response to your specific population. That's a winner. Have a clear organizational system for curriculum choice making that responds to your specific student population. If you don't do that, you're going to run into a problem called cherry picking, which we'll talk about too, which each teacher sort of chooses the thing they want to do. Okay, let's go. So the long term success of your mapping work is directly dependent on a clear system-wide view of how curriculum decisions will be made to best prepare your students for the future. Curriculum mapping is choice-making. You're gonna choose, make a lot of choices based on what I call future forward learning goals. And I've been doing a lot of writing on this with Allison Zamuda, and we'll make sure you get some readings that go along with this particular seminar, webinar, pardon me, to, to um, underscore this. Next slide. So let's take a look at this. I believe if you click on, you'll see some arrows, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, let's start here. That future forward learning goals are going to govern our decisions. This, is, this isn't all hierarchical. You could almost look at it lateral. Think of it more like that across the table as opposed to top down. But, but the idea is your mission, your future forward goals, your, what you want and aspire your students to be combined from input from schools and local context, your family, global challenges, 
personal commitments, those goals will inform the next level in your curriculum planning. Let's hit the arrow. And that's on the departmental and grade level decision-making level. So let's stop for a minute because there's a lot of school people on this right now and they're, I'm sure they know what I'm getting at. My science department makes decisions about what to cut out, cut back, consolidate, create. But if it's not informed by what we think is most important in terms of what we aspire for the school, then in fact, um, we tend to, to run into more ad hoc decision-making. So we wanna make sure when we're mapping, we're really clear on what matters most. Let's look at the next one. So to me, teachers are where the rubber meets the road. That's, that's where the action is. But teachers are informed by their grade levels, their departments. And if they don't have a clear sense of what will govern their choices, whether it's within their subjects, K through 12, whether it's an interdisciplinary theme they're working on, some schools do more than that, or it's more phenomena based. What do I mean by that? I mean, emergent curriculum, more personalized quests. Phenomena based is uh, I'm studying things I had not planned. We're living one of those right now, COVID. And so if I go back two years, you didn't see this coming. And so the idea here is it could be about something in the student's life. It could be something in the news, but there needs to be wiggle room there. How do I make those choices? Well, if I have those goals, I can make better choices moving forward. So our mapping is informed by our, forward, our future forward goals. Let's keep going here. And I think it's also, we start with a refreshed look at our mission. I, I really like looking at mission statements where the language is really um, powerful, really galvanizes, really pulls people together. It isn't pedestrian, if you know what I mean. It's not, you know, and it should be modern. You shouldn't have a mission statement you could have had 15 years ago. The world's very different. And what we're looking at is how that can make a difference. Next slide. We can also inform our goals with existing documents. Some of you might be doing portrait of a graduate. Some of you might be using transfer goals like from UBD or your IB schools using ATLs and approaches to learning. It's not like you have to start from scratch, but I am telling you right now, if I don't have this, I do not feel as a teacher like I'm part of an institution and I'm just trying to do the best I can and keep, the, keep this plane flying. And what we want is to ensure that we make those commitments because you can't do everything. You know, in our preparation, I'm just talking to two of you, my fellow panelists here. I, I didn't really say this out loud, but I'm gonna say it now. And that is, I think the biggest challenge for the educators listening right now is not determining what they're gonna teach, it's determining what they're not gonna teach because you just can't do everything. And so how do we make those, those decisions? And I think that's a, a, critical, um, a critical question. Next slide, please. So I'm going to ask you in the chat, to what extent does your school have future forward goals, things that are driver, drivers, or are they, are they, and are they directly informing your curriculum choices? Let's take uh, about two or three minutes. Does that sound good? That's perfect. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone when you're sending messages, um, you want to adjust it to panelists and attendees, which will be really great just so other folks can see your responses and we can get that engagement in there. These are terrific, I re and I appreciate your candor. You know, what's, what, what is good and, and that I know is true is people are really wrapping their heads around this. And it, and it, is, a, it is one year where we are doing a lot of reflecting too. 
but I think more than ever, what the pandemic has done is it's made it crystal clear. We really have to think about what matters most and what are the skill sets our students are going to need and need now. So um, I think this is, is very useful. So thank you for your comments. Um, I noticed some of you mentioned uh, DEIB and looking at the idea of uh, diversity, uh, inclusion, equity, and belonging, a sense of belonging. That's really important. That affects my choices in the curriculum. That affects how I group my kids. That groups how I differentiate or personalize. You, you, many interesting things are being, are being posted here. And I think there's a new appreciation for this. Let's continue on. Thank you very much for sharing. I, I genuinely appreciate it. By the way, can we save the chat? Because usually you can save the chat. If you can do that as a host, please do. That would be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll save the chat. All right. I Perfect. think the other thing is establishing priority standards. Because the one thing about standards is there's a lot of them. And, and the idea of a standard is to target a spine that's scaffolded and organized clearly of proficiency targets, but it is not a checklist. It's to be used in practice. And so if you can go to the next slide, one of the things that I think is particularly important that you can do is if we take our mission statement. And so here is one that I'm currently working on with a school in Argentina. And they are now moving over to something I really like, which is the role of the students. I like the pedagogy behind that. So if I take one set of those, and so let's go to the next slide where we can zoom in on that. And you look at, let's say, learners as, as agents of change. Let's go to the next slide, please. And we look at this, we want our students to be global and local ambassadors, engage with others to identify and explore authentic contemporary issues. This is good stuff ethical uh, citizens. As you read through this and you look at the idea of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, this was derived by teachers in that ad hoc team. We are now going through the curriculum on two levels. One, we're going through the standards and we're looking at places where we can in fact get traction for these three types of um, future forward goals for the roles for our learners and then develop them in the curriculum. So that, for example, if I'm even in something like language, and in this case, it's uh, English speaking as well as um, Spanish speaking, it's in Argentina. But if I go through the language pieces and there's an area where they want students to make a claim and support it, they're looking at including that as a place to deal with the advocacy place. Or we are looking at developing our ability to network and, and present and share with different audiences. They're looking at the global possibility. The point here is the marriage of the standards and the mission to inform the curriculum is really terrific, but you can't do everything. Next slide, please. So we want to clarify the role of standards. They are proficiency targets. They are not curriculum. Why? They don't tell you what to teach, when to teach, and how you're assessing. And many of our subject, many of the standards are quite language neutral, I mean, pardon me, content neutral in some ways. If I go to English, for example, and I am English speaker, so I'll use that one, but I recognize each language has its own. But in English, it, if, if I go to those standards, it's saying they want me to be able to read and respond to um, uh, narrative and show literary devices used by authors, but they're not telling me whether I'm reading a book by Saul Bellow or F. Scott Fitzgerald or I'm looking at Maya Angelou, the point here is that's my choice. That's our choice as a school. And they're not telling me how to assess it either. Some standards have more content. <coughs> You'll see that more explicitly stated in areas like science and social studies, for example. So I recognize that each discipline, each field has some specific targets or, and pardon me, uh, challenges. But what you wanna do is you're gonna have to make your priorities because they're quite overwhelming if we think we're covering them. You don't cover standards. In fact, here's a way of thinking of it. Standards are a list of proficiencies looking for a place to live in your school year. And we wanna bundle them. We wanna bundle them so that in an assessment, I see that I'm demonstrating that competence 
in an array of, of, of standards bundled together. So the example of the unit that I posted in shock was of TKM, To Kill a Mockingbird. The unit's called Somebody Else's Shoes. And in it, there is a really interesting assessment task that students do that meet a bundled set of standards. There are standards in English in that particular state where, and it's part of Common Core actually, where students are to take a, a um, writing piece, narrative, and show how the themes in that piece um, are revealed in another form of art. So in this instance, they're using Norman Rockwell's series on Southern justice and injustice. The visual images are striking and they're tying it to Harper's, Harper Lee's rendition in To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a great assessment. It's bundled. To do that task will probably be 10, 12 standards that are addressed. So one of the things I think is really good to do in a platform like Chalk is you have easy access to standards and you can draw from them and combine them and align them directly to your assessments. Now I wanna repeat, we'll do more on this, but I wanna kind of give you a heads up. Next slide. I've already stated, if you don't do this, then it's gonna be, I like this standard, I like this standard, as opposed to scaffolding the, the bundled standards over time. And you know we can call that a year long context where we can lay out the school year. Next slide. So that's the point that we're, what we're saying is if I lay out my second grade math, I'm going to bundle my standards. I'm looking at what I'm teaching and I'm looking at where I will position them across the year in a very logical way. And also for the record, I might be, um, I might be having my students do some writing in math, very likely. So I could be pulling from several areas. Remember in, in a lot of the uh, language arts uh, standards, there are writing standards in both nonfiction technical informational writing as well as in narrative. So I might be able to bundle standards from multiple fields. And again, I cannot say enough about how a mapping software platform allows you to do that and do it with more ease. Next slide, please. So here's another way that you're looking at using standards here. And so what it is, is you're um, laying out your standards in each unit. You can show how they appear across several units because you don't, a standard isn't developed like one time. It spirals sometimes even through the year. Next slide, please. So when you create a year long context tool, which is one of the things we recommend with mapping software is you wanna unpack your selected standards, um, define them and understand their, their structure and the meaning of the format headings. And my colleague, Marie Alcock has just done a brilliant job with this. And you know, this, this idea here is you take, you wanna understand what, how the standards are organized. You then can examine anchor headings and subheads that correspond with your school's language, organization, and grade level. Then you set priorities. What's in the foreground? What's in the background? And connect those priorities with your specific units so they're directly aligned to your assessments. Now, that was one, two, three, four, five points. I said them in about, what, two minutes? Not even that. This takes time, <laughs> just for the record. But it is a really a wonderful way to pull faculty together. And you can even do it with paper and, and on a table to start, you know, post-its, whatever, move things around. But eventually moving it over into the software platform is just fantastic because you're not alone. You're working as a faculty and it also allows you to get that vertical overview. Let's go to the next slide. Um, let's go and do the poll. What is the prevalent view and practice in your school regarding standards. Let's try this one again. Our standards have been unpacked, prioritized, and aligned in our curriculum K-12. Our standards have been unpacked, prioritized, and aligned with grade, grade through departments, meaning the first is full all the way through. The second is more building or grade level specific. Each standard does the, each teacher does the best they can to align to standards and the last standards are on another planet um, or they are another planet. 
So let's see what we get. Let's take just a minute. Okay, let's take a look. Are we getting any, Keenan? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, we're just over 60%. We'll give it another few seconds here, give everyone a chance to answer, and then uh, we'll close the poll. So maybe another way, 15. I know that each teacher is trying. What I, I, I wanted to simply say, you are not doing it systemically, that it's left to each teacher. That's just to clarify that. Um, and I appreciate, I saw that in the chat. I just want to make sure that I, I clarify that. So let's take a look at that. Interesting. What's really, I think, um, telling here is it's the third one that's the highest. That each teacher, you can see, I'm doing the best I can, but here's the problem. Remember my point about curriculum is a pathway? The reason we sometimes have gaps is inadvertently, I choose a set of standards that I think are important, but Keenan has my kids next year and he chooses different ones. That vertical articulation is the whole point of standards in many ways, so that the building stands up. Remember that point about architecture. So I think, I, as I recall in our poll before, standards were right up there. It was one of the, the most pressing problems people address. I'm telling you, I really get that. And we literally, and I, I'm just gonna be very direct on this, design gaps if we don't take care of this in a direct way. So let's go to our next slide. So one of the things we also wanna do is we wanna connect our, um, our standards and our work to, could be connected to central themes and connections. That's another thing you can deliberately do. So we're looking at what the concept is and where it naturally arrives. So when I lay out my year, it's not devoid of unit titles, it's just the opposite. I'm sort of looking at my, my projected scope and sequence. Where are, here's a good word, fruitful places for alignment. Next slide, please. Laying out standards deliberately across the year is matched to the unit. That was the point I was just getting at uh, before. And you can see in chalk that in this big geography unit, Keenan, that you've posted, I see a whole series of standards from an array of different subjects that really come together. That's a bundle. And that allows me to align these very deliberately to my assessments. However, if I'm a classroom teacher and I do this on my own and I suddenly look at next year's class and they don't build on this, then in fact, what happens is we have got a gap. It's not to say everything is like, has to be perfectly in sync. But I think what happens is we, if we're not aware of what we're doing, remember gaining information, then I think we can cause problems. Next slide, please. Your questions. So we've come basically to the end of this first session. We'll do a little bit of preview of coming attractions of what's coming next. Um, but um, we thought it might be of value to identify a scenario or a question that might emerge as you implement curriculum mapping. Kind of share a what if. And Keenan, I'm leaving it to you um, to pose questions or to look at what's come in. And let's take a moment to respond to those and finish up, and then we will be on our way. How's that? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Sorry, I was just looking at the Q&A to see. We do have some prepared ones, but um, I would love to, I've been seeing like a lot of engagement here. Um, and one actually just came in, so we're gonna go with it. Um, again, for folks, if you're looking to contribute, just make sure you drop it in the Q&A uh, section on Zoom, just so it pulls those out so we can actually see those. Uh, so we've got a question here from Erica Davis. Um, how do you gain traction with curriculum development when there is so much turnover and teachers are switching grades or leaving school or larger district imposes significant changes on school? Um, I think that is, a, a, is an absolutely on point question. And I would say, if you are a place that's highly transient, then you need 
the spine of the curriculum probably more than most. In other words, if I were in a school where the, the teachers, in fact, had been there for a long time, knew one another well, it doesn't mean you don't have gaps. It, the, the need may be less intense. So one of the things that you begin to do is to design for that very purpose. In other words, um, you would be looking at probably, again, a, a task force group that begins to lay out the most important priorities and the, the bottom line, the, the, this notion of what to cut, keep, create, which we're gonna talk about next time, about making those choices and saying, it's not only priority standards, but these, this is in fact the layout of our year and these are the priorities we're working on. Let me also reverse it. If I were in a school and, and I were coming to the school new, wouldn't it be terrific if I could log on to CHOP and see what the teacher did the year before with the kids that are coming? That, you know, I'll tell you who has a lot of turnover, and I have a hunch some of the people listening are from international schools. International schools have the most turnover of any place I know, um, uh, almost without exception, because teachers usually stay for about two years, students come and go. They really need this work and do a lot of it because what they're looking for is something they can count on. So I think the way you map in a place where you've got more turnover is a little different. I would be mapping so that at the beginning of the year, I'm doing more on intake. We get a lot of new students who come in. We're going to take a little bit more time to ascertain where they're coming from, as opposed to, say, a community where there's relatively little movement or transiency. So that goes both to the needs and to the possibilities. So good question. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm looking at time. We could probably take two more or something like that. Okay. And then I think I want to, the only question I have is maybe I can just talk through a little bit about next time. We don't necessarily have to go through all the slides. It's up to you. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> so the, there's one good, good one here. That's interesting. Um, so I wanted to bring that up. We do have prepared ones, but I, I just like sourcing them from people because you guys are dropping some really good questions here. Um, also, there are some that are specific about chalk. I'm not really gonna answer those live. Uh, we'll be answering those in the chat and then we'll also have some additional support options for those. So just as an FYI for folks. Um, some may argue, so this is a question that comes from Denise Teeples. I, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, some may argue that teachers are not trained for curriculum design and mapping, nor do they have the time. Do some districts strictly leave this up to a curriculum specialist? Um, that's a great uh, question. I think what's really interesting about that is um, a school that believes that and really doesn't um, adhere to the notion that, that teachers need to be responsive to their actual students is akin to saying, look, a doctor doesn't have time to learn how to respond to the specific patient. I just don't buy it. I'm saying, oh, some some other doctor can decide on what to prescribe and and how to to um, uh, diagnose what a patient needs. But watch, there are practices and guidelines for doctors, aren't there? There are medical procedures. There are new practices. But doctors have to be agile and design solutions for the specific patients they have. They can't say, oh, you've seen one patient, you've seen them all. So I think what uh, I would argue is that you can have a core group of curriculum designers who lay out a really rich and engaging map as long as it's matching the actual student population but where you're going to see teachers really make a difference, and you'll, we'll get into this next time, are on the daily lesson planning and experiences. So yeah, I've seen some really good work done in schools that house a great, say especially larger districts, a great and very alive um, approach, not your state ed department, go do it. But, but the point here is those teachers are the ones who do the adaptation. They're the ones who have to differentiate. They're the ones that we want to assist on that. And how do we pull those sources together? 
The other thing is, is teachers in a building need to have more control. So an answer to the question, and I love this question, is uh, let's say I'm in a district that has, we're working with a couple of big ones right now, 25 elementary schools. They're not all the same. They're not. They're really not. Kids move at different groupings and pacings. They have different needs. Guess who else is different? Teachers. Because here's the other thing. You know, we talk about curriculum and teaching. We really should also think a lot about learning. And, and the idea here is, as a teacher, I'm an instructional instrument. And here is the composition. And I need to deliver it. I need to adapt it. But I need to also be learning how my kids are learning so that I can make more astute shifts and changes. The other thing is it assumes you can finish curriculum. You're never going to finish curriculum. That's like saying knowledge stopped. I don't think so. Can you imagine a doctor saying, oh, I've just, I've just had enough. I'm tired of all these medical breakthroughs. Stop it. You know, you can't do that that there are going to be new practices and approaches that will inform your work as well. So yes, you can create, and I think that is a, actually a, a very legitimate approach, as long as you also um, in, believe and invest in the skill of your teachers to make adaptations for the actual people, the actual patients in their care, so they can be timely and responsive. Um, Keenan, I'm looking at the two, at you and, um, uh, and I'm thinking, uh, 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 Shinjini, about the time, and do we have time for one more, and then just go um, straight to our last, we can, I can just do a quick brief rundown of next time. What, what do you think? Yeah, we, we have a, about 30 questions <laughs> in the Q&A actually right now. Um, maybe... maybe I'm, I'm yours. I'll do yeah. what you want. Um, um, you know, I think... Um, people often have other things they're going to, but we've had a very big group and I'm happy. Yeah. Um, whatever you like, you're, you're I think let's, <laughs> let's, let's go with one more question here. Kenan, do you have anything in mind? I'm seeing a lot of good ones. It's really hard for me to choose too. Yeah, no, I'm just looking through them. Um... By the way, thank you all. These yeah, are some no, incredible these are some really questions. good questions. I apologize. I'm, I was looking through. I, there's a couple of new ones, good ones that came through, but I, I do want to kind of go. Um, there's one I found earlier on. So I was thinking this might be a decent one to end on. Uh, it might be a good kind of transition for a next one, too. Uh, but um, how do you help teachers prioritize standards? So that, sorry, this comes from Jen Ecola. Um, how do you help teachers prioritize standards when they say all of the standards are equally important? Well, I would say they're not. They're not for every student. That's just not so. I mean, I think I think that is a really good question because it expresses a commonly held misunderstanding. They're not all equal. They're not. And the other thing is that's like saying to, uh, again, the doctor analogy is perfect. All medicines are the same. All, you know, we have, you know, we have certain things we do. Remember how doctors take your vitals and they figure out where you are. But listen, if somebody's heart is really racing, they have to come up with a prescription specific for that person. And listen up, their age, their stage, their body weight, their um, any other preconditions, they can't just say once they're all the same. They're not. Also, you know, you've got to determine what's most important in this situation. And you might say, you know, the number one thing you've got to do is you need to drink more water. You don't say it's just a checklist. I, I would say this. Maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but what's new? Um, I, I think that what we have to do is um, really uh, understand and respect the enormous amount of demands on teachers. I really appreciate that. But if someone, if you deal with people who are asking this question a lot, they're all the same. I think the shoe's on the other foot. I said, let's start with what's in the best interest of the students. I would say, you have to show me. I can show you if you think they're all identical and the same. You're not necessarily going to meet the, you're not going to meet the needs of a whole bunch of these kids. You have to show me how it's in the student's best interest for it to be a checklist and you go through all of them. You're going to have to show that to me. And I don't think you can. So I think there's that. And then there's this other thing, one of my great late mentors, 
years ago said to me, always go for motive. That if, if a, a group is highly defensive about, well, we just think they're all the same, what's really behind it? Maybe it's because, you know, people aren't sure how to do it. Maybe they just need a little assistance or they want to be left alone or maybe there's just a little confusion. And sometimes people are right. They, they you know, I hear, here's the most common thing I hear that I think is legitimate. It's when teachers say, why should we start doing mapping when we start so many initiatives and never do finish them? I think that's a legitimate point. So the point here is find out maybe what's behind that point of view. That would be my, my coaching. So let's talk a little bit about next time. We're going to be looking at um, our next session. We'll be dealing on launching a quality mapping program. And let's just go through the slides quickly. And then um, we're going to be looking at, at going deeper on the future forward goals. We're going to be looking at, let's keep rolling on how to determine what to cut, keep, create. We're going to be looking at big picture mapping, that is scope and sequence and vertical design. Um, we'll be diving into the elements, all of these, and how to develop good desired outcomes, essential questions, big ideas, content skills, formative, summative assessments, how to make some of these choices. We'll definitely talk about lesson planning too. That's a promise. I think that's real important. That's come out of this interaction. How you make those choices at each of those elements and how they work together, both in your scope and sequence, but on the unit level and on the lesson plan level too. So we'll be looking at different levels of mapping. Um, let's keep this rolling. We're doing pretty good here. The big picture, how to do scope and sequence work. Um, let's go to the next. The unit level, which by the way is my favorite. That's, that's, that is, that is the special golden spot. And we're going to definitely work on that. And then we'll look at daily planning and what I think is a new movement in education called learning sets that I want to share with you, which are even better than older style models. So we did the Q and A and um, our next session will be uh, next Thursday at 3 PM. There's a big group. I'm really happy that you were able to hang in there with us. And I want to thank Scott. Um, I feel so relaxed and easy with you. And I felt very free and I loved your questions. I wish I could have answered and interacted with each one of you. So I'll turn it over to my host. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks so much, Heidi. Heidi, do you have question uh, time for maybe two or more questions? There's three more popping up, that's why. <laughs> um, so we have one here from Laura, if you don't mind. So she's asking. Sure. Yeah, so she's asking, okay, how long do we allow our teachers to do mapping and until when? And exactly, you know, how long is this process? And I think there's a lot of questions around this, you know, how long do people have to map and how much time do they have to really spend on it as administrators, as uh, teachers? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a certainly reasonable question. And I think one of the things to, first of all, recognize, and I appreciated the way it was framed. If I understood it, it was to kind of get it started. I want to repeat, you're not going to finish this. You never finish curriculum. You're always going to be informing it. But when I look at the um, first phases, I think the first and second phase where you're launching and getting it going, there's a couple variables that will make a big difference. If your faculty has had a lot of uh, training and work on curriculum design and assessment design, it goes much faster. A number of the districts and schools that were represented, and I imagine there's all kinds, international and private and whatever, mentioned they'd done a lot of work with standards. So if I'm with a school that's already done quite a bit of work with standards, that's going to ensure that we, we make headway too. So to start with is the readiness level. If you haven't, it's going to take longer. And I think what it is, is also size of district and the scope of it. And in fact, if you're organized around sort of um, coaching teams, if there's an organizational structure inherent there where you're, you're already have talented um, people who have the capacity to turnkey and coach, that makes a difference. Um, so there's, there's, there's that question, the scale of it. I would say on average, if you have quite a few of these factors in place, you can get a very good uh, run on this your first in the first academic year 
if you determine where you want to target your efforts. So it could be elementary starts with one subject. It could definitely be that way. But if you're organized and you have more people who have those readiness levels, you could start with several and divide and conquer. You could have, you could begin to lay out some of those plans. The other is time, of course. And if you have professional development time, some places before COVID on a regular basis, um, sometimes I've been, I've been in districts where the board, the uh, you know, board of education or the school board has set aside weekly or every two weeks, there would be a planning block to work on this. And we would do, we do modest moves in goal setting. To me, uh, one thing I'll be getting at next week is the most important thing I think is to not just do it all at once, to slow down, believe it or not. To learn how to do a one really good quality unit map is the most important skill set. And if you concentrate on that, then people can begin to propagate and, and, and populate the work. It's when you try to do too much at first that it slows it down. But in general, I would say, you know, many of the districts that I've worked with, within about two years, we've really got things cooking. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple schools where, and districts where we've really moved it along beautifully. And now they're into extensive assessment reviews and beginning to um, uh, do a lot of fine tuning. But this is something for the long haul. This isn't this is not a quick fix. Sure. And finally, I think leadership really matters and distributive leadership really matters. Um, if you think this is a top down and the czar is gonna say, you're gonna all do this, you're in a, you're in the, you really are on another planet. This, this really requires a lot of collaboration and camaraderie. So, um, yeah. okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs, for the wonderful answer and for the wonderful session. We're seeing so much love already on uh, our chat. <laughs> and uh, we had yeah. a big group, my yeah. gosh, with over 600. And yeah. I think there's a lot of interest, but it also speaks to you and your openness. And can I also say, all of you listening in, I guess you're noticing these two.